Hi, and welcome back. Let's start with the same loop of drums we used last time, with the compression bypassed, and listen to the hi-hats in particular. Now listen again with the compression turned on, and notice the pumping in level that I pointed out at the end of part two, and the way this changes the groove of the hi-hat part, accenting hits that weren't accented in the original performance. The release time makes a big difference here. Tuning it just a little bit slower makes the hats ride up more gradually, which is a lot groovier than jumping out unexpectedly. And also significantly tames the pumping effect on the crash cymbal. There are two lessons to learn from this. When compressing complex signals like a drum kit submix, or a full mix, the compression will make different parts interact with one another. This is key to the famous gluing effect that can result from compressing a full mix. And the other lesson, compression can profoundly affect the groove of a part. So even with the longer release, we've got more pumping of the hi-hats and cymbals than I'm happy with. So let's go through the different ways we can tame your compression once you've found suitable attack and release settings. Actually, there are four different ways to do this. First of all, we could raise the threshold back up. This makes the cymbal pumping much less noticeable. However, this has also changed when we're compressing. We're now only catching the loudest peaks instead of digging down into the body of the sound. And the compression character changes considerably as a result. So the second approach would be to leave the threshold set quite low and reduce the ratio instead. Now the compression happens at exactly the same time, but there's just less of it. With auto gain turned on, the ratio control can give you less or more of the same compression. And with low enough ratios, the pumping of the cymbals and hi-hats is subtle enough to avoid sounding too unnatural. The third method is more obscure. I'll keep a low threshold and a high ratio, but limit the amount of gain reduction using the range slider. This can be useful on drums if you want to add a very consistent punch to quiet ghost notes as well as louder hits but it's a less commonly used method, and most compressors don't actually provide a range control at all. By contrast, the final method is very much in vogue. I'm going to blend the compressed signal with the original input signal to create parallel compression, sometimes known as New York compression. In practice, this is quite intuitive. Simply blend the two signals till you like what you hear. And if necessary, you can trim down the level of the mixed signal using the main output control on the bottom bar. But parallel compression actually changes the compression behaviour in complex and subtle ways. If you just want less of the same compression, turning down the ratio is still a better option. And as parallel compression makes the sound of the compression more subtle and the effects of parameter changes more difficult to hear, it's not very useful when you're trying to learn what compression sounds like. So I would suggest two basic approaches. When processing a subgroup like this drum bus, I might keep the threshold low, so the compression rides the signal most of the time, and set a gentle ratio of two to one or lower. But when processing individual parts within a mix, like this guitar part, for example, I might set a higher ratio of four to one or above. Then set the threshold so that the signal bounces above and below it, rather than pushing into the compression all the time. But that said, let's overdo it again to start with so we can hear what too much compression sounds like. Now notice what happens with a very fast release. First of all, we've changed the groove of the part again. 
let's bypass and notice the dynamics of those double notes with the first note accented. With the compression on, both notes are equal weight, which sounds much more robotic and less groovy. But we've also changed the way this part blends with the rest of the mix. The compressed version kind of elbows the other guitar and the keys out of the way, and sits resolutely in front of them all the time. If I did the same thing to the other parts as well, they'd all be jostling for attention at the front all trying to be loud all the time. The mix would sound cluttered, and there'd be no space left for the vocal. Now let's try setting a slower release, so we hold down the levels for longer after each pluck. And also a slower attack, so we let the start of each pluck squeeze through before the compressor has time to react. And the effect on the groove is now reversed, with the first pluck accented, and the second held back slightly. OK, let's back off the threshold to a more sensible level. And actually, I'm going to set it so that it barely catches the loudest plucks. To understand why, I'll need to turn off looping and let the song run onto the end to give us some more context. In this relatively sparsely arranged section of the song, the guitar doesn't really need much dynamic control. The guitar and the keyboard parts are carefully arranged to bounce off each other and fit around each other naturally. But the dynamics of the guitar change dramatically in other sections. So over the course of the song, this part will be bouncing over the threshold in places and dropping back below it in others. Let's watch the gain reduction meters for both guitars and the keys and see how they work together. Each compressor is catching the bits that would otherwise be too loud and controlling those parts with a relatively high ratio. But the rest of the time the signal drops back below the threshold and we preserve the part's natural dynamic shape. But too loud is a relative subjective measure. You're going to need to listen in context to judge where to set your threshold. And just like EQ settings, you'll probably need to iterate. You can't make a final judgement about guitar compression until the keyboard compressor is set appropriately, and vice versa. This isn't the whole story, however. All three of these parts are rooted to a subgroup with another compressor on it. This time the threshold is set quite low, so the compressor is riding the signal most of the time. And I've set a gentle low ratio to avoid compressing too much. If I temporarily increase the ratio, you might be able to hear that, like the hi-hats in the drum example, each part is being ducked in level according to the dynamics of the other two parts. With a gentle low ratio setting, this isn't noticeable at all. But the interaction between parts helps them to fit around one another better. When one part gets louder, the other two get ducked out of the way slightly to make room. This is particularly important at the end of the song, when Guitar 2 takes a bit of a solo. The compression keeps us from getting too loud and overpowering the whole mix. But turns down all three parts together, so the lead guitar doesn't get ducked behind the other two parts. OK, let's rewind. And before I leave you, we're going to look at the compressor that's processing the whole mix. Some people will warn you to be very careful when compressing your whole mix. They might even advise you not to do it at all and leave it for the mastering stage. But I say nonsense. Go ahead and smash the living daylights out of your mixes, as this is the best way to learn what compression sounds like and train your ears to recognise the side effects. Full mixes can be very challenging for a compressor, as they literally contain everything. Drum transients can be shaped by the attack time, as we did earlier. While the release time will control the gluing effect and the interaction between all the parts, Smashing a mix hard can also help to highlight the differences between the compression styles. Don't be afraid to experiment with wrong choices, like the vocal style, for example. Or the pumping style. This one is specifically designed not to be transparent, so I wouldn't normally choose it for the mix bus. 
but the exaggerated attack might help you to tune your ears into that choking effect it can have on transients and help you to recognise it when you hear subtler versions of that effect with other styles or other compressors. And likewise, the extra pumpy character of the release might help to tune your ears into the sound of an audibly pumping compressor and help you to notice that effect in future. You probably won't want to print your mix like this, however, so when you've finished experimenting, try switching to the mastering style. This style is designed to react gracefully and transparently, even with very complex full mixes, and it's kind of difficult to make it sound bad. You can use the attack time to control the punchiness of drums, but the results are much more refined than with some of the other styles, with never any hint of spikiness or choking transients. And you can set a faster release time to increase the interaction between parts and create a stronger glue effect. But the compression resolutely refuses to pump unnaturally. If you set a gentle low ratio of about 1.5 to 1, and aim for only a couple of dB of gain reduction. You're pretty much guaranteed not to do any harm. But if you toggle bypass, the compressed version usually sounds a little bit better. Subtly punchier, denser, and better glued together as a mix. Of course, it's very important to set your output gain properly when comparing. If you don't add enough makeup gain, the compressed version will always sound smaller than the original. But if you add too much, the compressed version will be louder, which will always seem more impressive. And you can fool yourself into thinking you've improved the sound, when in fact you've made it worse, but louder. OK, I'm going to leave you with a quick summary. As with EQ, you're going to have to train your ears to notice the effects of compression. This is going to take time and practice, but the results are definitely worth the effort. Don't be afraid to dig in and really compress signals hard. Keep adding more compression until you can clearly hear the effects of the attack and release parameters. It's easy to then dial the compression back once you set those appropriately. Make sure you set an appropriate amount of makeup gain so your ears are not fooled by a big volume change when bypassing. And again, the same advice as for EQ. You can't judge whether a part is too loud or too quiet unless you have the rest of the mix for context. So be careful not to overuse the solo button when mixing. Thanks for watching.